Hello, uh, welcome to Everest Group's webinar on key global services trends shaping 2022. Uh, I'm Jim Atarora, a partner with Everest Group, joining in from sunny Texas. And I'm delighted to have with me Prashre, who's joining me from Gurgaon. Prashre, welcome. Thank you, Jimit. Uh, hi, everyone. Pleasure to be talking on this webinar today. Uh, of course, we'd be discussing what's hot in the global sourcing industry, and we'll be covering key themes uh, and trends observed in last year and coming forward for this year as well. Excellent. So, Prash, I know, I know I introduced myself and I introduced your geography. Can you just tell everyone a bit about your role at Everest Group? Sure. Uh, so, I'm a vice president with our global sourcing team, essentially helping clients on their workforce decisions, location decisions, and helping them set up their GBSs and growing them from an evolution and a maturity standpoint as well. Excellent. And quite a year it's been so far, right? As we as we think back to what's happened already and, and, and a lot to go on, right? So what we really wanted to unpack in today's discussion was five mega trends that we see shaping uh, the rest of the year. And maybe with that, we can dive right into the first one. So uh, any kind of a conversation about what's really happening in the global services industry is incomplete without being able to comment on, hey, what's really the growth trajectory, growth outlook? And what we are declaring right now, and yes, there's some, there's some macro shocks to be aware of, but we do see the industry to be at the start of a mega growth cycle, right? 2021 was a phenomenal year for the industry, recovering from the pandemic. And we expect 2022 to also continue that growth momentum that we saw, right? And as we try to unpack that a bit more, right? This is, this is a, a examination of the industry that we do across a couple of lenses what we are essentially looking at here is what's the 12 months rolling growth for the IT services industry, which is the dark blue line um, on the screen. And then the business process services industry, which is the lighter blue line, right? And what we are actually evaluating here is the organic constant currency growth on a rolling 12 month basis. So you'll see, you know, as we approached March of 20, you know, we saw this sharp decline in growth, which kind of coincided with the pandemic. Uh, BPS market operations tends to be more resilient, so that did not go below the zero curve. Technology seems to have more discretionary spending, which is why it dipped into negative territory, but you can also see how quick the recovery was. But as you think through it, from that period of 12 months ending March 21, the the revenue growth curve for the sector has been increasing quite dramatically and we do expect that to continue for the rest of the year forecasting roughly about 10 percent across both of these of these sectors and as we look at that there's there's some other uh, metrics that also become important to look at to understand the health of the industry and we're looking at this across both lenses both from an outsourcing point of view as well as a GBS point of view, which is the internal model. So if you look at the number of publicly announced outsourcing deals, 2021 uh, was a record setting year, right? So the highest number of outsourcing deals, more than 2,100 that we saw uh, in, in 2021, representing an over 10% increase, recognize that deals announced in 2021 will continue to create runway for the industry for the, last, for, for the next several years. The other thing that we've also seen, and we've actually seen more activity already in 2022, is just in terms of the offshore, nearshore GBS center setup happen, right? Prashra, I know you mentioned this is something you help clients with, so you've probably been very busy helping clients take some of these decisions around where to go, how to set up, et cetera. Sure. Um, and Jimin, I think 2020 uh, was some bit of a low year. Uh, again, um, Clients had paused uh, many of their strategic long-term initiatives on the GPS side, especially. Uh, of course, such decisions also require a lot of capex upfront. Uh, a lot of these setups require due diligence through travel as well. So 
2020, there was a period of lull, but we are seeing that pent up demand come back into the market and come back with a big bang, right? So uh, we are expecting even more growth in 2022 as travel restrictions open up and organizations finally deploy the strategy to set up more GBS locations in even more number of locations. Excellent. And I think what's, what's also been interesting as I, as I look at some of the other call outs we had was there's a lot of uh, smaller companies that are participating in the GBS market, right? Um, and, and as we look at it, small enterprises account for over 60% of the deals now and 56% of the new center setups. So in some ways, the outsourcing in GBS market is no longer the purview of, hey, you have to be a really large company to establish setting up your own centers. Uh, and then there's also a lot more digital activity that we're seeing in the, in the environment. So again, the growth trajectory is strong across the external and internal models. So as we, as we move forward, you know, uh, there's, there's a variety of factors that we expect to drive growth in, in 2022. You know, uh, some sentiments to kind of think through is, we do expect this to be fairly inclusive across industries. Uh, we are expecting a pretty significant digital adoption among traditional players. There's an increase in next generation business models. And, and in some ways we're also seeing asset heavy deals come back. In some cases it's more SaaS centric, but new business models are important. What's going to be another really key factor and we'll unpack this more as we, as we make progress is the talent shortage that we're seeing in a lot of geographies. Inflationary pressures on enterprises are causing them to re-examine costs and therefore look at outsourcing and offshoring in a more holistic manner. And then, you know, there's, there's a lot more uh, confidence in the GBS model and then organizations are pushing their GBS entities to deliver more, all of which means more scope, more locations, more headcount, more growth, right? So a lot of growth, but Prashay, um, any kind of a conversation about growth would be incomplete without also acknowledging some of the risks to watch out for. So what are some of the risks you're seeing our, our clients put in place or monitor as we look at the rest of the year? Sure. Um, Ajimit, I think both on a business front, microeconomic front, as well as a person front as well, right? In the last year, the year before that as well, uh, has been times of significant upheaval. Uh, new risks coming out, things which organizations hadn't really planned for and solved for. Uh, as we continue looking forward to the growth of the industry, some of these still way on top of industries thinking. Um, emergence of new COVID variants. Uh, well, now everybody's planning return to offices and back to normal, but an uncertainty still hangs of what happens and of what severity will happen next, right? Um, as of start of this year, geopolitical tensions. Uh, has uh, emerged as a key risk area and a concern area for many enterprises, obviously with widespread impact in multiple countries in Central Eastern Europe, uh, but also then raising questions of potentially where might the next, next geopolitical tension come up from, right? Um, you know, as we see uh, such tensions also arise with China, will locations in Asia Pacific also be affected uh, whenever uh, this sort of a next uh, risk arises. That's, that's something which organizations are now definitely preparing for. Questions are being asked, BCP measures, uh, mitigation strategies are being planned out as a look towards the long-term plans. And of course, macroeconomic uncertainty. Um, there was all, always a cloud of macroeconomic uncertainty till 2019. Uh, of course, the pandemic accelerated some of these thinkings, but then the stimulus and the boost to the economy had mitigated it for some time. But now that the, the government is tapering the boost which it was giving to the economy, uh, there are also questions on how long can the boom last in the global macroeconomic situation. And, and Prasha, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the more optimistic view here. I do think that some of the fundamentals for growth suggest, yes, let's watch out for these risks. But I feel really confident that you know, the trajectory that the industry is on is going to continue for a period of time. And, and, and with that, you know, what, what maybe we should do is break apart some of the different segments of the, of the landscape. And uh, 
in the previous section, we spoke about how the different models have done well, both the external model, which is the, the one with the service providers and the ones with, with uh, the, the internal or the GBS, right? One of the things we've seen is to keep up with this business demand, third-party entities. So the service providers are leveraging inorganic strategies to drive growth to gain an edge. Prasha, I would love to hear your views on this. I know you've been working with a number of companies on these initiatives. What's really happening? Can we dissect the growth? What's going on from an organic perspective? Which segments are seeing growth? And then what specific inorganic strategies have you seen be successful? Sure. Um, and Jamit, before we move into, you know, especially the inorganic growth elements, just taking a step back, seeing where the growth is coming in the third party service provider world. Um, and of course, what we'll show on these slides is a breakdown of outsourcing deals, both by value as well as by deal duration, right? So what you definitely see on the chart on the left-hand side is that there has been a significant growth in the year 2021 in the large deal segment, right? These are deals above the $200 million mark. Um, and a lot of these large deals are being driven by multiple factors at enterprises, right? Uh, of course, there's a bit of vendor consolidation happening, but the pent up demand is also leading to higher spend from enterprises. Uh, of course, with most of the enterprises as they seek to meet new business models, there's also a need for rapid digitalization leading to increased spending, right? So all factors pointing towards a large deal segment growing, especially fast. And then if you look at the chart on the right-hand side at uh, the deal duration analysis, we're also seeing a significant increase in the long-term deal segment, which is deals above seven years. Now, uh, again, this is being driven by multiple factors. A key factor is that as organizations look at large deals, they like to do this for a longer period as well. Uh, there are long-term optimization initiatives, which organizations seek to embark on. And then, of course, as you know, needle move more towards fundamental transformation, especially on digital aspects, and then just incremental technology changes, the duration of deals also increases proportionately, right? So all of these factors pointing towards larger deals, longer term deals, uh, all in all, you know, these are factors which point towards a positive sentiment, optimistic market as we look going forward. Um, if we assess the outsourcing market by buyer geography or where the demand is originating from, as well as industry, uh, I wouldn't say there are big surprises here or significant changes. Um, of course, uh, when looking at the buyer demand geography, uh, North America and rest of Europe are increasing steadily. They have been on that in a steadily increasing path for quite some time now. Uh, the share of UK in the outsourcing deals has decreased somewhat, and uh, so has the share of rest of the world, right? So lagging a bit behind North America and rest of Europe. If we look at industries, um, technology still remains uh, the biggest driver, the one which is increasing fastest. Government sector is decreasing, some uncertainties in outsourcing over there as well. Uh, manufacturing, energy, and utilities are also sectors where we saw a lot of growth in 2021, right? Uh, but uh, again, these were two sectors where 2020 uh, and 2019 had been slower years uh, earlier as well, right? So going forward, we still see technology and BFSI account for most of the deals. Uh, and a you know, healthy uptick in some of the other segments as well. You know, Prasha, what's really encouraging for me as I, as I hear you talk through what's really happened, because these are some of the lagging indicators which predict where the industry is going to go. Uh, looking at those larger deals, longer term deals means that things are baked in. The second, just looking at this particular slide, uh, you know, it, it feels a lot like this is very balanced growth, right? And we expect, so this isn't like one industry running away with it. So it tells me that the optimism that we are seeing is being felt across the board. So that's quite, that's quite encouraging. Absolutely, Chilin. And, you know, as we look at service providers, especially how do they deal with this growth or drive further aspirations of even more growth, right? Uh, 
Uh, one of the easiest routes they have taken is uh, the inorganic growth route. Um, and we've seen a tremendous increase in the mergers and acquisitions done by service providers, right? And a lot of them have come on digital focused assets. Um, of course, this was driven by multiple factors. Uh, most of the service providers were cash surplus uh, in 2021 as well, you know, in line with uh, how well their businesses have been doing as well. But areas uh, where we saw a uh, highest m a activity were actually automation and cloud, which point towards a fundamental need from the service providers as well to increase and enhance these capabilities. Now, most of the demand from customers is on these activities. Uh, service providers also trying to beef up their capabilities on the same segments. There are uh, multiple other factors which are driving these mergers and acquisitions as well. Uh, one of the factors possibly which we'll touch in more detail later also is talent acquisition. The last 12 months uh, been a period of a significant war on talent uh, across all geographies and service providers faced with an ever increasing demand from clients, right? Uh, of course, uh, that's a good problem to have for service providers, but then as a look at solutions, um, acquiring ready-made talent and skilled large-scale teams uh, has been one of their priority areas as they consider some of their mergers and acquisitions. Uh, beyond that, there were some deals uh, where most of the focus was on business growth in specific geographies, specific industry segments, as service providers look to acquire uh, companies with a specific domain expertise, which they wanted to grow further on. Now, there is another aspect of service providers in organic growth, which has uh, emerged at the forefront in the last couple of years. And this is their uh, acquisition of GBSs or the in-house operations of enterprises. Now, what we saw in 2020 is that a lot of enterprises were actually facing cost pressure. They were facing challenges in transitioning to the new workforce models. Uh, and of course, uh, service providers uh, played the savior for many enterprises, overtaking their uh, GBS operations as well, um, providing the much needed cash infusion with some enterprises needed, uh, but at the same time, uh, also helping them transition from a workforce and a service delivery model as well, right? As we look going forward, uh, there are still key benefits for enterprises in considering the strategy. Um, you know, accelerating digital transformation, uh, leveraging service provider capabilities in niche areas and domains where the in-house centers themselves may not have the best of capabilities. Uh, those have been areas which enterprises have looked upon as positives coming out from such deals. And of course, from a provider point of view, it provides, it provides you with sustainable revenue for a longer period of time. You get uh, quick access to ready skilled talent, which you can not just deploy for this current client, but deploy in multiple other clients as well, right? Uh, and one of the biggest benefits which we've seen for service providers is uh, the talent which is acquired in such deals uh, often comes with that much needed industry and domain expertise beyond the technology and operations expertise which service providers are really good at, right? So uh, such deals also helping set base for further revenue growth of service providers. Yeah, and and Prashya, what I what I find really interesting is that while transactions such as this were rare, and we saw them after the previous financial crisis as well, it feels like the desire to construct transactions like this is no longer a desperation move to raise capital, like we saw post the two thousand eight financial crisis there's a more strategic lens to a number of these where it's a, it's a, Hey, we want to have an accelerated outsourcing and offshoring play. We've built some capability and we want to make sure we are capitalizing on that capability as we grow. So I have seen the mindset around this become very um, interesting over the last few years. And we continue to see active conversations where GBS leaders are thinking very strategically about how they construct some of these partnerships. So it's good to see that we are seeing we're seeing some really big numbers in here as well. Yeah, and Jimit, I like the fact that you use the word partnership. 
I think that's come at the forefront of service provider and GBS relationship as well in the last few months, right? Um, for a long period of time, the two models were seen as competitors of each other. In a way, they still are. But of late, what has also changed is the way in which they are enabling uh, each other as well, right? And GBS is now looking at service providers to partner with, uh, you know, as they undertake the digital transformation journey for the enterprise as well. So you know, more of a partnership play, which we see with GBS is, uh, especially in the dealing with service providers as it comes along now. Excellent. Lovely. So high growth industry, We've seen that you know the the provider side, the external side, is seeing a lot of activity from a M and A and inorganic route. I do think that there's a special call out that needs to happen in terms of what we are seeing from a talent perspective. And this, to me, feels like the one area. You know, we speak all about hey, there's supply chain shortages holding up production of cars. And, and globally holding up the production of PCs because we don't have semiconductors. If there's one key risk that we also need to be watching for is the ability for the services industry to solve for the talent supply chain, right? And we think this is gonna be important across both the GBS model as well as the service providers to ensure that there's growth in, in the different geographies. So as we look to unpack this a bit, Right. Um, we did our key issue study earlier this year, late last year, and there's an expectation of pretty significant growth across the stack. So if you look at some of the statistics on the left, overall market headcount growth is expected to be about seven and a half percent. Right. To put that in context, I think for 2021, that was about four percent. Where people are expecting to see most growth. Asia Pacific, which from a global delivery perspective has been the largest um, destination geography. There, there's an expectation about a 12% growth, so pretty significant. Roughly 5% in Europe, UK. Uh, so four and a half in Europe, UK, and six and a half percent in North America. So again, you take any region, it's significantly higher than the growth expectations we had last year. And then if you look on the right side, and this to me was really interesting where we literally had an inversion of the priorities that people had or challenges that people had in 2021 versus what they had right now. In 2021, adapting to new business models was really the big issue that people had. Same for 2020 and recognize that this was, the 2020 results were pre-COVID in some ways. The 2021 adapting to new business models was more of a post-COVID thesis unanimously right talent remains one of the biggest issues in the in, in the industry and and if you look at that finding ways to solve for this talent is going to be one of the key factors that we expect companies to focus on for the rest of this year a lot of work going on right now in terms of thinking about how you build supply chain resilience from a talent standpoint right and as we look at that, there's some location dimensions that emerge. So if we, if we move forward, um, you know, you're seeing changes across the stack. So some geographies tend to have more challenges versus others. Uh, Prashay, what are you seeing right now? I know we, we, we've done this key issue study maybe three months ago. Is the situation oh, yeah. still the same or do you think, do you think things are changing somewhat? Yeah. Uh so I think everybody likes to talk about talent in the services industry these days, right? Uh, the challenge for talent, I think it's even more widespread beyond services industry. It's across industries, across departments, right? What it has spiraled into over the last few months is very high attrition levels, uh, very high compensation expectations, and then increase in you know, rate cards as well. Now, there is no silver bullet. There is no easy answer, which you know, which is there on the talent situation. As this chart shows on the left hand side, uh, all of the geographies worldwide are grappling with talent challenges. Right, uh, so there needs to be a fundamental rethink of the workforce model. But especially the uh, gravity of this uh, issue 
is significantly higher in North America and Western Europe, right? There are multiple reasons behind that. Uh, I think we were always seeing uh, issues with uh, rapid talent availability in these geographies. Uh, I mean, the population, the dem demographics of these uh, two geographies, North America and Western Europe, uh, it's been seen aging, it's been seeing aging populations. That's contributing to lower availability of talent as well. What we've been seeing over the last um, 12 months, I'd say, is a particularly a particular decrease in unemployment rates as well, right? Uh, and a lot of this is being driven by changes in preference of the employees themselves right now. Um, if you look in the post-COVID boom, uh, there has been a lot of demand from the company side either on transformation side to grow businesses, to adapt new business models as well, right? At the same time, from an employee's perspective, um, during the years of the COVID-19 pandemic, they lived in a lockdown situation. Um, the relations and collaboration with colleagues was strained. Um, as soon as you know, activities reopened, many of them took decisions to change their jobs as well. Uh, many of them are fundamentally thinking about what kind of a work-life balance they want. Many of them choosing early retirement, many choosing part-time jobs as well, right? So especially in North America, Western Europe, we are seeing the talent preferences uh, drive a lot of this talent shortage as well, right? Now, uh, that's not to say that the talent shortage is not there in other geographies as well. Uh, if you see the typical offshoring of the global service delivery destinations, such as India, Central Eastern Europe, uh, there is a war for talent even in these locations, right? But not as much as uh, North America and Western Europe. Now, while there are many solutions to the talent problem, um, upskilling, uh, better deployment of the remote working or the hybrid uh, work models as well, one of the fundamental factors uh, which companies are looking to to solve this talent situation is also which new locations should they tap into and as we look at an overall level between different geos uh, we are seeing a far higher growth in the offshore destinations these are typical uh, low cost destinations such as uh, india philippines certain central eastern europe and latin america and somewhat slower growth in center setups in Western Europe and North America. And we are seeing this trend continue even more for 2022 as well. You know, I think, I think this would be a great point to kind of get some um, pulse checks from our audience. And, you know, we'd, we'd love to see on the poll um, on your screen where you expect locations to move. So which expect which locations you expect to grow versus stay steady versus decline. Love to get some user input too. So, so look forward to that. So yeah, I think I think you raise you raise a good case for the need for global location diversification pressure. Uh, and I and I do agree that any kind of a conversation about the health of the global services market is incomplete without a discourse on talent. So thank you, thank you for that. Sure, uh, and Jimit, we'll now further break this down into different aspects of these geographies and locations as well. Uh, so kind of double clicking into the offshore location strategy which companies are deploying as well, right? Now, as we discussed earlier, 2020 was a slow year for center setups, multiple challenges, right? Budget constraint, demand constraints, travel constraints. 2021, we saw that growth. 2022, we expect even further growth. But as we see the nature of this growth, what we are seeing is two main, uh, two main areas or uh, ways in which this is different from uh, previous strategies, right? In the established offshoring geographies, we are seeing companies go for the lesser known uh, delivery locations of the tier two and tier three cities. We are seeing this growth in locations such as India, Philippines, and in Central Eastern Europe as well. Uh, essentially, drivers for this is companies want to base their operations closer to from where the talent comes from and not 
really look at talent which has to be relocated or migrate uh, to larger uh, metropolitan areas right so apart from the fact that companies want to be closer where talent uh, is is coming from uh, and of course this is meeting with talent preference as well uh, at the same time this also seeks to de-risk the concentration risk uh, which many companies have in these large metropolitan areas of the key offshore geographies. Um, and of course, uh, with the pressure on increasing wages, uh, increasing rental cost as well, uh, of course, the tier two, tier three center setup strategy works well on an optimization front as well. Now, we talked about what companies are doing in the traditional well-recognized offshoring geographies. At the same time, what is happening is companies are also evaluating and making fast decisions on some new emerging locations. Uh, these are the kind of locations which did not see a lot of activity, uh, I would say, you know, before the last three to four years as well, right? If you look at Asia Pacific, Vietnam and Sri Lanka have seen a lot of center setup activities, uh, multiple examples across other geographies as well, whether that's Croatia and Europe. Uh, in Latin America, a lot of activity in Jamaica and Guatemala as well. Uh, but a special region of focus for many companies has been the Africa region and the Middle East region. Uh, companies, especially for Africa, taking a longer term view, multi-decade view into how they see the talent proposition of the continent changing, right? With one of the youngest uh, talent demographics, Africa is emerging on the talent radars of companies as they make their location decisions. Prasha, I think this is one of the themes that keeps coming back. And the sentiment that I keep pick up, picking up from clients is that more is more, right? Three years ago, there was this whole thesis towards consolidate, create global hubs, less was more, but now more is more. You can't have enough service providers, you can't have enough locations, you can't have enough GBS centers. Again, Risk is paramount. How do you create resilience in the services supply chain? Perfect. Hey, speaking of more GBS centers, right? Let us, let's also kind of unpack a bit about what's really going on in the GBS space. Uh, and we do believe that, that the GBS model, as we already saw, is poised for a lot of growth. There's a lot of new center activity going on. And as we think about the next generation of value creation, it is the ability to drive business transformation and acting as an integrated business partner for the enterprise that's going to cause the next evolution, if we may, in, in the GBS space. So if we, if we look to kind of decompose that a bit more, right? We think that if there's one major thing that came out of the, of the pandemic, lots of bad, but a few good things, the GBS model in some ways, was the beneficiary of everything that happened over the last couple of years, right? And we kind of described it as the model becoming more resilient, right? So service delivery out of organizations that had GBSs was, was significantly superior to the ones that had other models in place. As a result, GBSs got recognized uh, we've been looking at the NPS scores and the NPS scores for most of these organizations went up by 10 to 25 points, uh, which is pretty significant if you think about where the typical GB, the, the typical NPS lands. So that went up and in a lot of ways, you know, um, beyond being resilient and recognized, companies focus on using this as a transformation lever has been renewed, right? And we are seeing that there's a lot more pull approach to work ingestion. The, the enterprise wants to know, hey, what more can you do? How quickly can you take that on? Can you be the champion for our future of work agenda? Can you be the champion for our digital transformation agenda? So as we've seen the evolution in this market, been, been really excited to see what's been accomplished over the last two years and what's likely to continue to happen as we, as we look forward, right? Sure. And then, Prashay, sorry, I know, I know you had some thoughts in terms of where we go as well. So what's, what's your point of view on this? Yeah, and just two things which I want to talk about from a GBS world, right? Um, I think two things which really helped the GBS evolution uh, over the last year. I think first factor being that uh, 
some of the perceptions which were there around what work can be done in a virtual or a remote environment versus not. Uh, of course, with everybody moving into a forced remote working environment, some of those perceptions got shattered, right? So it opened uh, so many new doors for the GBS in terms of services and functions and to the extent which they can support uh, the overall enterprise. Um, earlier, while you know, there were certain functions, uh, let's say, especially on sales, marketing, things which enterprise leaders prefer to do from the same office space, which they thought required in-person uh, collaboration based out of the same physical space, uh, those perceptions got shattered, right? Uh, and that's one thing which has worked really well in favor of the GBS model uh, as they look at new avenues and new service areas to go into. So that was fact one. Uh, fact two also is a change in the mindset and perception, uh, especially with what the GBS is capable of. Now, as GBS has got forced into a model where they had to go above and beyond, most of them met up to the expectations and asks from the parent enterprise, right? So some of the enterprises which used to view the GBS from a service delivery only mindset really recognize the fact that GBS is uh, supported uh, so many new different operational areas, so many new geographies, uh, and practically scaling up these capabilities overnight in many cases, right? So uh, again, Jamit, as you said, right, I think the confidence is renewed in the resilient GBS model. Yeah, and, and we did the survey for GBS organizations uh, as well a few months back. Um, now, as many of these organizations have been facing increasing wage bills, increasing cost related to hybrid delivery, uh, of course, driving cost optimization has come out as one of the key priorities for the GBS respondents. But if you see, overlook the next few priorities with GBS respondents have listed out Many of them are net new priorities, the kind of priorities which we did not used to see three or four years back, right? So GBSs in many organizations are leading the charter to creating the hybrid working model um, and, and also creating tools to deploy this across the enterprise and not just to the GBS organization. Uh, Reskilling and up upskilling the GBS workforce as well as the enterprise workforce to meet talent demand. That's been a key focus area for GBSs as well. And you know, with the entire shift on digital transformation, new digital models, uh, accelerating innovation again is coming out as a key priority for GBS organizations. Uh, I think many of these facts we've already talked about earlier as well, but you know, GBS organizations in, in many cases need to be aware of aspects of the GBS to ensure that they are ready for the uh, increased maturity and expectations uh, from the enterprise as well. A uh, few questions which GBSs have to ask themselves is, uh, what are the kind of support areas which are being provided to the enterprise right now? You know, what is the support, let's say, a build versus a run, core areas versus non-core areas, right? Areas which are impacting revenue uh, and top line of the enterprise as well. The kind of role which the GBS is playing in adopting new business models as well, as many organizations change their business models and the way in which they work, uh, what role is GBS playing in that, right? How is it helping the organization themselves uh, tap into newer business segments? Uh, you know, that remains a focus area for many GBSs as well. Of course, leveraging digital capabilities within the GBS organization itself to drive optimization, automation, and acceleration of the digital journey. Uh, that remains something which the D, uh, GBS organization have to plan for as well. I think the location aspect we've already talked mm -hmm. about earlier as well. Um, uh, questions are being asked sometimes whether there is too much of a concentration risk in few locations. Uh, what should GBSs do? What is the BCP strategy, risk mitigation strategy? Is hybrid working and remote delivery the only fallback option? Should you look at more locations? Should you look at smaller centers, micro centers, just to de-risk some of the congested sites, right? So a lot of questions for GBS is to think about and ponder as they plan for the next wave of evolution. Yeah, and, and you know, Prashya, what's been exciting for me over the last three years is I've been spending more time with some of our GBS clients is that the sentiment seems to be 
and I joke about this. Hey, GBS has a new definition. It has a, the, the acronym has new meaning. I call it go be super, right? And that's the journey that it feels that GBSs are on. And, and, and it's, it's really great to see all of the strategic choices in front of us. And again, victims of their own success, so cannot complain, you know? Absolutely, Jamit. I think we raise many issues, but really not uh, things which are, you know, negative sentiments uh, for the overall model. I mean, high growth, which we are seeing, some of these are growth associated pangs, which all organization, all business models have to uh, go along with, right? So uh, all of these are actually opportunity areas. Uh, as we talk about all of the aspects here, you know, these are just areas in which GBSs can further prove the impact which they drive to the global enterprise. So, hey, I, I, I want to I wanna make sure we keep progress here. So we've, we've gone through four themes, mega growth across the service provider model, across the GBS model. Talent's going to be a big issue to watch out for, right? So those were four of the mega trends we unpacked. The fifth one that I wanted to get into in some ways cuts across all of this. And it's been very heartening, very reassuring to note that the global services industry has really embraced the charter of ESG. You know, we've, we've spoken about the, the trifecta of balancing people, planet, profits embracing diversity and sustainability as an industry has been an important aspect that we thought needed to happen. And everything that we are seeing thus far makes us believe that the entire global services community is getting very, um, it's not just in the realm of conversation. There's a lot of activity that's going on, real activity which not only helps with the sustainability goals that companies have put out, but actually should help alleviate some of the talent concerns that we see, right? Just wanted to take a few minutes to unpack that. Uh, but that to me is the mega trend number five that we need to make sure that, that the industry continues to accelerate on. So again, as you, as you think about it, ESG pillars have been, have been evolving significantly. And here's where it's been very interesting to see across elements of, of the environment and sustainability agendas. You know, even example with, with Google, again, not, not sharing any confidential information here. It's all out in the, in the public domain. And I think it's important for these kind of initiatives to be out in the public domain because they create a momentum of others wanting to replicate that, right? And you're seeing some of the biggest brands in technology out there, you know, um, Google's working on their own sustainability agenda, data centers operating at 50% less energy consumption than, than previously, right? Uh, social agenda, diversity, inclusion, impact hiring has been important. Microsoft's been a key proponent in this. And then establishing uh, ADCs, as they're calling them, African Development Centers for Digital Services. It's creating new sources of talent in areas that are, um, uh, you know, meaning some of this the most. But we spoke about, hey, there might be a bit of a talent issue in the world right now. So creating these, these seeds for longer term talent play, we think becomes really important. So there's the sustainability dimension on the environmental piece. I also think that social creates the talent sustainability piece as well. And then finally, associated with that is the whole thesis around impact sourcing, right? And impact sourcing is one of the key dimensions that we see becomes important for organizations, even in the short term, to address some of the, the talent challenges that we are seeing, right? We just, we just recently did a, a LinkedIn Live event on this, you know, and, and talked through the different strategies that companies have. The good news is that it creates some direct benefits. So you get access to untapped talent, you get a pool of fairly stable and engaged employees that are less likely to leave, right? So that's the more direct attribution. And then there's also indirect implications where you're helping meet social goals and objectives, and you are really fostering this whole culture and creating visibility for diversity, equity, and inclusion, 
which is very quickly becoming a board level agenda. And it's, it's really exciting to see that companies like Accenture, Teleperformance, IBM, Microsoft, Infosys, TCS, the biggest names in the industry, both from a service provider standpoint, as well as a service recipient standpoint, are investing in this space to make this more exciting. So I'm really encouraged with the progress that we've made here. And it's great to see that DEI, ESG, sustainability charters have made it to the top five mega themes impacting global services. So with that pressure, I know, I know we've, we've spoken about this, you've touched upon some of this, a lot of optimism, but let's not keep the blinders on. I know you've been cautioning me about, hey, there are some things that we need to watch out for. Uh, so any, any closing thoughts in terms of how we take a balanced approach for the rest of the year? Uh, and I, mean, I think the last two years, especially, uh, one of the biggest learning for people has been uh, that there's no challenge too great which cannot be overcome, right? So uh, while, while there's increased confidence and comfort which people and organization have, uh, I think as you mentioned, right, we should not also turn away from potential risk and disruptions which may happen in the future. So there's an improved understanding also of the fact that uh, better preparations uh, for these uh, unthinkable scenarios, or at least unthinkable scenarios, uh, you know, which would have been a few years back, uh, some of these uh, low probability but high impact events, uh, better planning and strategy to tackle them, I think uh, that will only add even more value, resilience, and contribute to growth uh, and sustainability of enterprises, right? So um, uh, COVID uh, still remains as an overhanging cloud. Geopolitical tensions still continue to feed into overall macroeconomic expectations, as well as to disruptions, uh, not just in the services industry, but multiple other industries such as supply chain and others as well, right? So again, few factors which uh, companies uh, need to think about, plan mitigation strategies in advance, and more importantly, test out these strategies as well once a while, just to check the robustness of their planning as well. Yep. Very, very well said, Prashant. And, and I go back to what was there on that slide, right? We cannot predict the future, but you know, you can try to overcome some of it through the right set of intelligence. You know, thank you for kind of listening in. We have a number of intelligence resources available to you through our blog through our perspectives and, and published content, the Market Vista report, which, which you, um, I know, Prasha, we brought up some of that. The Ukraine crisis, we've got a special resources section. So yes, we cannot see the future, but we do wanna make sure we're providing the right resources to be prepared for all of these eventualities, for these number of black swan events that we see. Uh, thank you for listening in. Look forward to your questions and comments.